We're taking a peek at section 3.4, uh, graphs of polynomial functions. Let's make that plural. Um, and we've done a lot of the groundwork in 3.3 for this. And one of the things I want to emphasize is this idea of zeros. Um, so zeros are basically when f of x is equal to zero. And, uh, or, or you could also say when y is equal to zero. Many zeros are x-intercepts. Not all zeros are x-intercepts, but all x-intercepts are zeros. We'll get to that piece uh, in a later chapter. Uh, for right now, let's just think of zeros as x-intercepts, knowing that x-intercepts shows us some of the zeros, not, not necessarily all of them. So um, if I had something like uh, g of x equals x minus 2 squared, get another one up here too. So how do I find them? And we talked a little bit last time about this. Uh, we're setting it equal to zero and then factoring. And this one's already coming to us in factored form. So notice I have x minus 2 squared. So what makes this a zero? Well, 2. That's a possibility. So notice if I plug a 2 in, if I go g of 2, um, this would be 2 minus 2. 0 squared, 0 times anything is 0. So 2 are some of my zeros or x-intercepts. And then what makes this a zero? Well, 2x plus 3, set that equal to zero and solve it. Subtract 3, divide by 2, negative 3 halves. So this has these two zeros. It's interesting to me, though, if you think about the degree of this, this is an x squared, and this is a 2x. So if you were to multiply this out, it would be, actually be 2x cubed. The degree is 3, but this only has these two listed zeros. Interesting. Uh, how about this one? How do we get the zeros out of this? Well, we're going to have to factor it. Um, and if I try to do factor by grouping here, I'm not going to get anywhere. So at this point, we're not sure what to do. I'm going to I'm going to just lean on technology a little bit for it and see what I got. So one four one and six. Looks like I've got one that one, and I've got one at negative two and one at negative three. So I could plug those back in. For example, if I go like f of one, yeah, it's a zero, or f of negative two, yeah, it's also a zero. So those are there. I didn't, I couldn't get there by factoring uh, in the factoring techniques that I have, but the technology showed me they existed. Uh, let's do, let's do another one. I'm going to change this, doctor this one up a little bit. See if I can do something with this. So let's see. Uh, let me try some factor by grouping here. I could take out an x squared from these first terms. Uh, these two terms I could take out a negative 4. Right, and that turns to positive 4 because I took a negative out. I now have an x plus 4. I can factor out of each of these. That leaves me an x squared minus a 4. Here's the difference of squares, so I could factor this. So it looks like my zeros would be what makes this a zero? Negative four. What makes this a zero? Negative two. What makes this a zero? Positive two. And that would give me some zeros, some zeros there. So we have these factoring techniques we can use to help find them. Um, if they come to us factored as well, it's kind of interesting. I'm kind of interested in this x minus two squared times two x plus three. Let's take a look at what the graph of this looks like. So I'm going to grab, grab decimals again. Bring it on down. So here's my, remember we said we had one here at two and one here at negative three halves. Now this negative three halves, this is really, this makes a lot of sense to me. This is just like a little linear piece, right? Two X minus three. And if you zoom in really close on that zero, it makes like what looks like a straight, it's not a straight line, but the closer you get to the zero that comes off of this, this looks more and more like a straight line. Now that's, that's super interesting. Um, so locally, what happens around zeros is they start to conform to kind of this factor because this is like pushing you closer and closer to zero. This has a lot of weight at the zero. If I zoom out a bit, a little bit, and if I look at this one at the two, notice that this is, this two comes from a squaring. It kind of happens twice, right? Because it, the, you think of this x minus two times x minus two. But this squaring, when I zoom in onto this zero, 
what happens is it's not exactly a quadratic, but it starts to look a lot like this quadratic. You know, it starts to look a lot like um, x minus 2 squared. And it doesn't match it exactly, but the closer you get to it, the more it's going to look like it. So what happens with this, we, we would say that this 0 has a multiplicity of 2 because it happens twice. And locally, it looks like a little parabola. Kind of interesting. So this 0, we'd say it has a multiplicity of 2. So thinking about this idea of a, of a multiplicity, right, a function that looked like this. I'm going to think about, like, what are my zeros? So one of my zeros is at negative 3. One of them is at 4. And one of them is at negative 1. But this 4, since it's inside this square, this has a multiplicity of 2. And this negative 1, since it's inside this cubic, has a multiplicity of 3. And remember, cubics look like, like that or like that when it's just something cubed. So let's look at what happens to this on, uh, on Desmos. Let's take a peek at it. So look at this. The, the one that comes from negative 3 looks like a nice straight line. The one that comes from x minus 4 looks like a quadratic. You zoom in, right? Does a little quadratic there. And this one that comes from the cubic looks like x cubed. So locally, what happens again with these, these multiplicities is they take on the shape of that multiplicity, right? x squared looks like this or like this. x cubed looks like that or like that, depending on what direction it's going. So that means we could, we could sketch a graph that, like, for example, this graph right here. Let's say we have f of x equals negative 2, x plus 3 squared times x minus 5. Now we know a couple things about this. We know that there's a 0 at negative 3. We know there's a 0 at 5. We know that if we were to multiply this out, we have an x squared times x, so that gives us an x cubed as a leading term, but it's also multiplied by negative 2. So the leading term of this would be negative 2x squared. So it must go down to the right, it must go up to the left because they do opposite stuff. Locally, this is a little parabola, so it goes something like this. This is just a linear piece, so it's going to come through it, something like that. It's not exactly linear, right, but it looks linear there, but it will have some, some curve to it. Now, there actually is one other piece we could do. We could actually get the y-intercept here because I know that the last term, let's see, 3 squared is 9. This is a negative 5. And that's going to get multiplied by negative 2. If I multiply all those together, that's going to give me my y, which is going to be way up high somewhere. So basically, it'll look something, uh, something like this. Um, great, so we have these shapes. We have some ideas about what they look like. Now, all of these polynomials we're working with are continuous. What that means is when you draw them, they just keep going. You never, you never have to lift up your pen as you're drawing them. And it goes on forever in both directions. There's no gaps and no jumps in these polynomials, right? There's nothing that goes boop like that. So that being said, we can use what's called the intermediate value theorem. And basically, uh, I'm going to say this. If there's some number x that's between a and b, think of these as inputs, then the output when you throw an x into the function has to be between the a and the b. Now, it might, it could be this as well, but it has to be between them. In other words, what I'm saying is if I have one of these, I've got some, some value a, say it's here, and some value b, say it's here. This is where f of a would be, and this is where f of b would be. That has to take on all of these values between them. Like, if I have this x range, everything in my y range is between those things. So what that means is, uh, if f of a, f of b are opposites, right, one's positive and one's negative, then there's a zero in there. At least one. 
right? Like, let's say f of a is here, and f of b is here. What this is saying is, in this range from a to b, there has to be a zero because it has it's continuous and it has to get from here down to here. We don't know where it does it. You know, if it does it really early, if it waits till the last minute, or if it does it a bunch of times. Like there could be a million of them. There has to be at least one. That's what intermediate value theorem gives us. So here's a claim. So that function has at least two zeros between x equals 1 and x equals 4. Well, let's check it out. Um, so first off, I'm going to just get that function in my calculator. So let's see. There's that function. And let's make a table. And uh, I have it set so that it'll, it'll have to ask me for values. So let's see. When x is 1... This function evaluates to 5. When x is 4, this function evaluates to 2. So actually, if I just look at 1 and 4, uh, that doesn't give me a lot of information. Like, are my inputs between 1 and 4 have to be between 2 and 5. I'm not even guaranteed a single 0 between those. So let's try some other values. Let's plug in 2. Oh, there's a 0. That's interesting. Let's plug in 3. And let's plug in 4. Oh, okay, this is nice. So there's a zero here at two. So at least there's one that exists. I can just see it. But notice this goes from five to negative three. But then this goes from negative three to two. So there's got to be another zero in here because it has to, to go from negative three to two, it has to go through zero. So three point something will give me another one. That's proof that there's at least two zeros in there. That is sufficient. Now let's try and write an equation for this crazy thing. Whoa. Um, okay, so it looks like it's coming down through this negative 1. It looks like it makes a little cubic at that negative 1. So I'm going to say that. Uh, it looks like it does a little quadratic here at 2. So I'm going to say x minus 2 squared. And it looks like it just passes through 6. So I'm going to say x minus 6. And I have some function. Oh, and it looks like this is the point 0, negative 3. So I'm going to say... I have some multiplier out here. So I've got all this. I just don't know what this multiplier is. But I can use this information to help me get there. In other words, when x is 0, y is negative 3. The output's negative 3. So negative 3 is some multiplier, and x is 0. 0 plus 1 cubed, 0 minus 2 squared, 0 minus 6. OK? So let's see. This is 1 times 4 times 6, which is 24, so 24, oh, negative 6, so it's negative 24, a equals negative 3, so divide both sides by negative 24, that's the 3 24ths, what is that, 1 8th, yeah, so my a would be 1 8th, so that means I can put a 1 8th into there, and that would be uh, an equation that would match this graph, it's not drawn great. You know, I don't really know. I didn't pay attention to what this happens. Well, in order to go through all those points, it has to be this. This is the answer. Um, I, you know, just with the sketches, we're not sure about, like, how accurate that part of the sketch is. All right. Hey, you should be able to go back and forth between these representa representations at this point. Uh, if you have any questions, message me or post them in the forums.